The third one is also very similar. You want to turn your nodes to vectors. Somebody gives you a graph. You want to come up with your matrix. You have your source node, and there is a neighborhood around that node based on your edges and based on your sampling strategy. So this paper is all about the random walk or sampling strategy, S. We know about the skip gram model. The skip gram model is going to model the probability of this neighborhood, the neighborhood of that node, based on its representation. Then you're going to make a bunch of assumptions, like conditional independence, which says that the elements of that neighbor or the members of that neighborhood are independent from each other as soon as you know the representation for you. There is some symmetry in feature space assumption also that you have the same representation as the input and the output. So you're applying the same function on your NIs, on your neighbors, and on yourself. So under these two assumptions, you can write down your objective function. This term down here, after taking the log, is going to give you a negative log of ZU. So that's your ZU. It's the term in the denominator. And the numerator, because this product, after taking the log, is going to turn into a summation. It's going to give you a summation over the neighbors in the neighborhood. We know that this is expensive to compute. That's why we are going to use negative sampling. You show it some positive examples, some negative examples, and then you keep training them. So there is no surprises there. We covered one random walk, and that random walk was depth first. So you would just sample next and sample the next one, the next one. You can do breadth first, which is going to give you another type of sampling strategy, or you can have something in between, or you can have you can try to have control over these two, so have something in between. And that's the idea of this paper. So it's about your random walk. So let's go into a, more details. This is the ith node in your walk, first node, second node, third node. The first node is going to be your u. Then you want to know what is the probability of you going to the node x, given that previously in your walk, you were at node v. If there is no connection between V and X, that's easy. You shouldn't go there. You set it to be zero. Otherwise, if there is a connection, you need to associate some probability and then normalize it. So Z is your normalization constant. So that it, these outputs add up to one. So that it actually gives you a probability. But what is this pi of VX? It's the transition probability between V and X. How do you set it? Maybe one idea is to look at the edge weights. But what if the edge weights are one? How would you set that? So this is an example. This is for illustration purposes. Let's say in your walk, you just transitioned from T to V. So this is what you, the step that you took. You transitioned from T to V. Now you're at V and you're evaluating. Should I go back? Should I go to X1? Should I go to X2? Should I go to X3? Yes, you are going to multiply it by the weight on your graph, on your, on your edges. And then the other one is you can play around and parameterize your alpha by two hyperparameters, P and Q. And these are the exact hyperparameters that are going to help you control. Do you want to do depth first or breadth first or something in between? Let's see why. What is TDTX? What is your decision? What are you basing your decision on? Let's say this is the shortest path between two nodes, T and X. So what is the shortest path between T and T? It's zero. What is the shortest path between T and X1? So it's one, there is one edge here. The shortest path between T and X2 is two, one, two. The shortest path between T and X3 is two, one, two. And based on those numbers, you are choosing your, prob your probabilities. One of them is one over P, the other one is one, the other one is one over Q. But let's study these hyperparameters. If P is bigger than Q and P is bigger than one, what's going to happen? One over P is going to be less than one. One over P is going to be less than one over Q. So one over P is less than this number. It's also less than one over Q. It means that you're associating a lower probability of going back. In the other way, what happens if P is less than Q and P is less than one? So one over P is gonna be bigger than one, one over P is gonna be bigger than one over Q. So this is gonna be the largest number. 
it means that you're associating a higher probability of going backwards. So you can associate a name to that hyperparameter. This hyperparameter is a return parameter. As you change it, you're gonna either make it more likely or less likely to go back. How about Q? If Q is bigger than one, these numbers are gonna be smaller than one. So you're gonna stay uh, close. If it's less than one, you're gonna explore more. So you can associate an in and out, a name to Q, it's in out parameter. So if Q is bigger than one, you're gonna stay local because the probability of this guy is gonna be small. So you're gonna stay local where you are. If it's bigger than, if it's less than one, this number is gonna be bigger than one. So you're gonna explore, you're gonna go out. And based on these two hyperparameters, P and Q, you can approximately interpolate between breadth first search and depth first search. So you can play around with those two numbers based on your data set. And somebody might say, okay, after I do my training, what if I want to classify my edges rather than classify my nodes? What features are you going to associate to edges? And you have multiple options. You can average out the feature for this node and the other node. You can do a Hadamard product between the features of those two nodes, giving you that edge. You can do weighted L1 or weighted L2, and you can read the paper, which one is better, and that depends on your data set again. But intuitively, let's study Q. We studied two cases. One was Q bigger than one, one was Q less than one. And let's apply it on the novel Les Miserables. On the data coming from that, you have 77 nodes and this many edges in that graph. You can set Q to be two, P to be one. You find the representations for your nodes. As soon as you have vectors associated for each node, you can compute distances, L2 distances. And as soon as you have distances on your data, you can do clustering. You can cluster your data into K clusters. One, two, three, four, five, six clusters. And then you can play around, uh, you can actually draw it. You can associate different colors to your clusters and see what Q is doing. If Q is two, you're staying local. So you're discovering local neighborhoods. So this is a local neighborhood. That's another local neighborhood, another local neighborhood here, here, and here. If you set Q to be 0.5, you're going to discover nodes that have similar functionality. Like the yellow nodes are actually your leaf nodes. They, have, they are like leaves in your graph. These blue ones are transitions from yellows to reds. Reds have a lot of connections. So this is the structural role of your nodes. For instance, some of the people on a social media are leaders. And then at the same time, you might have local clusters of people talking to each other.